never forget the moment that my grandmother gave me permission to be myself. I was seven years old, and my sister and I were spending the day at my grandparents' farm, and I don't know what she had done, but my sister got in trouble, and my grandma had yelled at her. Shortly after, I went to grandma and asked if I could turn on the TV to watch Sesame Street, and she snapped at me. Now, I don't remember what she said, but I do remember what I snapped back. <laughs> don't you take your anger at her out on me? I know. <laughs> <laughs> it's safe to say that most adults probably would have reprimanded me, but Grandma did not. She smirked, shook her head, and walked away. And in that moment, she taught me that my feelings mattered. That was a rare occurrence for me. I was definitely the kind of kid that felt all the feels all the time. But when I would express my anger or worry or sorrow, I was often met with, don't you talk to me like that. I don't know what to tell you, Ash. Or my favorite, you're overreacting. So eventually I learned that it was much better just to distort my emotions, to meet others' expectations, or to just shut them down completely. At the same time, I spent most of my life chronically ill, both in my body and in my mind. I was a fourth grader who packed her pockets full of ibuprofen to manage daily headaches. And I brought extra underwear to high school because I was scared that my heavy menstrual bleeding would lead to a public state of embarrassment. All the while, I wrestled with anxiety and the kind of depression that constantly made me want to take my own life. And it all came to a head in my mid-20s. I was struggling with chronic fatigue, acid in my stomach, daily migraines, and my mood and mind were so volatile that I received a psychiatric diagnosis that I was told was only manageable through a lifelong regimen of medication. I was facing the very real possibility that I would never be happy or healthy. But that just wasn't gonna work for me. Now, not everyone gets to make that choice. They don't have that privilege. But luckily, I had ended up in the right career. I was and still am a licensed professional counselor. I'm now also a researcher, educator, yoga instructor, relational therapist, and I specialize in integrative models of healthcare. But when I first began, I focused on the neurobiology of post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD. At a very basic level, trauma happens every time our nervous system is overwhelmed. Combat, a natural disaster, sexual assault. These events evoke an emotional response in our body to fight, to flee, to fix, or to cry. Emotion quite literally means to motivate action. But in these events, such actions are pointless because they're not going to resolve the situation. So our body is super smart, and it shuts that emotional response down and readily replays it any time we experience a similar event in the present. That's basically what happens during a flashback. And it's a neurological roller coaster that makes us very vulnerable to physical disease and mental disorder. But here's the thing. That process doesn't just happen during large events. It can happen every day. Like when you're a small, defenseless child and a large, loud adult yells at you. Or when your boss says a sexist comment, but you can't say anything because doing so would threaten your financial security. These are everyday traumas, and they affect our nervous system in the exact same way that the large events do, just at a different scale. So what I was learning is that physical disease and mental disorder result when emotions are shut down. Now, I had no idea how detrimental it had been to distort and shut down my emotions as a kid, but now, after 14 years of studying communication, interpersonal neurobiology, counseling, and integrative models of healing, it's become crystal clear that those messages I was receiving about my feelings were the reason I was so sick. So what we need to understand is a better way 
to process our emotion. Because emotion is not just a part of being human. It might be the single most important tool that we have. And I believe that it might be the solution to many of our modern day problems. Allow me to introduce you to your five-dimensional human. Yeah, that's what it looks like, right? <laughs> so the neurobiology of emotion is quite complex, right? But the model that I'm going to share with you today is a way to break it down. These four pillars represent the first four dimensions of our human. Body, mind, relationship, and energy. And as you'll see, the connective thread between them is emotion. Now, I, out on the outside here, represent the fifth dimension, consciousness, our being. If this is our human, our consciousness is our being. Consciousness observes and operates the lower four dimensions. It's the part of you that moves around your awareness and attention, and whatever you attend to, you experience. So if you focus on the chair that you're sitting on, you experience it. If you call to mind somebody that you love, you experience them even if they're not around. So our consciousness allows us to intentionally make choices that can move the thread of emotion to create a happy, healthy human. Let me explain. Let's start with that first dimension, the body. Today we're going to focus on a set of neurological mechanisms called affective systems, and we can thank Dr. Yank Pekzeb and Lucy Biven for their lifelong research that discovered them. Affective systems create motivation in our body to act. We have seven systems, and they create motivations aligned with their names. Rage, lust, fear, care, panic, seeking, and play. These systems trigger energy in our body with the single goal of motivating action. So when I was upset with my grandma, the rage system is what allowed me to express myself. But let's use a different example. Let's say you're also seven years old and your puppy passes away. It's heartbreaking, right? So your affective systems of care and panic are going to change your body, pull your shoulders in, tighten your chest, and create a frown on your face to motivate you to cry, to mourn, to let go. And if everything in your human is operating correctly, that information will then flow into the second dimension, into your mind. And the mind is where we put words to sensations and perceptions in the form of thoughts. And when thoughts come together, they create what Dr. Dan Siegel called states of mind. So the state of mind here might be, my puppy died and I feel sad. Because the affective system motivation matches your state of mind, it facilitates a flow that connects your mind to your body and begins that process of emotion. This then allows this information to slide into the next dimension, relationship. Individual bodies and minds come together automatically and neurologically through a process called simulation. Simulation is what happens when you walk into a room and two people have been fighting and you immediately know something went down. You don't have to look at them, they don't have to say a thing. You can feel it in your body, right? And then your mind has to make sense of that. Is this me? Is this them? I don't know. So in the process of simulation in our example, <clears throat> what will happen is that your parents' nervous system will automatically pick up on the sensations of sorrow. And so when they feel that with you, they might resonate with you, right? And their own mind might tell a story as well. We are so sad the puppy passed away. They feel it with you. And this resonance or empathy allows them to teach you that sorrow is safe to feel and to share. So it connects your individual body and mind 
with that third dimension of relationship. So now we have the flow of emotion almost all the way there. But the last thing we need to do is connect this to some sort of action. And now we're going to talk about that fourth dimension, energy. And in this, we're talking about the electricity in your autonomic nervous system, your automatic nervous system. This is the one that powers your heart and regulates your breathing without you necessarily having to feel about it. So Dr. Stephen Porges is the one who spent his life researching this idea. And what he found is that in order to act in an empowered way, we must have social engagement. It is a requirement in order to be happy and healthy. So when your parent resonates with you, the electricity from your shoulders and your chest and your face gets discharged. You cry, right? You shake, you cry, and that electricity gets discharged. Your body returns to a neutral state. Your mind calms down. Your relationships are marked by connection. And it's all because you completed that flow by acting. This is flow. I feel sad that my puppy passed away. I shared it with my dad. And together we acted. We mourned and we created a memorial. Feel, share, act. This is emotion. Emotion is not a part of being human. It is the single phenomenon that makes being human possible. And when it gets shut down, we get sick. So let's change our example just a little bit. So your puppy passes away, the care and the panic systems still activate and pull your shoulders in, cause your frown, right? You might also be able to feel that and label it appropriately. I am sad because my puppy died. But in this instance, instead of being able to empathize with you, when your parent unconsciously picks up your sensations of sorrow, they go into problem solving. Don't be sad. It's fine, it's fine, we'll get you another puppy, it's okay. In that moment, your human learns that sorrow is not something to be felt, it's something to be fixed. Or maybe your parent becomes impatient and irritated. You're overreacting. Get over it already. Big boys don't cry. Well, in this case, you learn that not only should you not feel sorrow, but if you do feel sorrow, there's something wrong with you. So what happens to all that affective system energy that was triggered in your body? If this happens one time, no big deal. Your body will recover, your human will recover. But if this happens over and over and over again in those everyday traumas, or if this happens one time during a larger event, such as the passing of your parent, it will cause problems. And the physical and mental problems that will result will differ depending on which affective system was triggered. But in our example, we're talking about your shoulders, your chest, your sinuses, your nose, your mouth. They get stuck and inflamed. And then they create mucus, which makes you vulnerable to physical disease. Your state of mind will change from I'm sad to there's something wrong with me. And then that script replays over and over and over, making you vulnerable to anxiety and depression. You will learn that isolation and conflict are perhaps the only ways to deal with loss. And you're either going to be amped up all the time from fixing or fatigued from having to hide. When we shut each other down, when we say, don't talk to me like that, I don't know what to tell you, you're overreacting, we're making each other sick. And it's got to stop. Because although this might appear to be a personal problem, I believe it's at the core of our current societal distress. We need to stop telling boys that anger is the only option because it's creating mental health issues that is causing them to commit atrocious acts of terror. We need to stop telling girls that their upset and worry 
isn't okay, that they're crazy, because it's creating a mass epidemic of female reproductive problems. We need to stop suggesting that people of color are unwelcome because it puts them at an exponentially higher risk for physical disease and mental disorder than their white counterparts. We need to stop criticizing LGBTQ communities for living in their love because it makes them twice as likely to turn to substances. And if I'm speaking for myself and my community, we need to stop telling people with sensory sensitivities and deep empathic abilities that they're overreacting. Because we can experience something you can't. And being told that it's not real can make us so miserable that we'd rather die. We gotta stop shutting each other down, especially because there's a better way. If each of us can use our fifth dimension and consciously reconnect the integrative flow of emotion, if we can feel and share and act and create a happy, healthy human, inflammation goes down, our state of mind becomes clear, relationships are marked by connection, and we have endless energy. And that automatically gives people permission to do the same. Now I call myself an integrative lifestyle doctor, and this is exactly what I empower people to do, because I believe that happier, healthier humans will create a happier, healthier world. I mean, how much kinder would you be if you weren't in chronic pain? How much would you care about the environment if you weren't constantly battling the demons in your own mind? How much more generous would you be if you had the guarantee that others would be generous in return? And can you imagine how much creativity we would all contribute if we weren't so tired all the time? My life has been marked by chronic illness, but I've learned that there's a different way. And so now I practice feel, share, act every day and it gives me a lot of hope for humanity because I think that we can create a happy, healthy world, but we all must feel to heal. Thank you. <laughs>